Um, show of hands, how many people love monoliths? <laughs> love them, absolutely. OK, two hands. Uh, show of hands, how many people hate monoliths? OK, everybody else. Um, I don't know if the camera could capture the audience, but two hands loved monoliths. Everybody else hated them. Um, but I feel our feelings towards monolithic applications are rarely because of its monolithic nature. It's mostly about how easy the monolith is to manage. These applications usually start with small scope, but they soon get out of hand and turn into this beast that we feel we can no longer control. Uh, my name is Sayyid Hamza Shah, and I'll be sharing a few recipes on how to tame the beast that is your monolith. Our focus is going to be a monolithic web service, but there are recipes I'll share that can be copied over to any monolith. First, I'd like to mention that I work at Deliveroo. We work with restaurants and riders to efficiently deliver food to diners. We operate in a number of countries, including Singapore. The journey of Deliveroo's tech might be familiar to many who have worked with a monolith. We started operations with a single web service. With time, the business grew, and so did the web service. A few years later, it became clear that the business was outgrowing the efficiency that the monolith could provide. We decided to move from a monolithic web service to a service-oriented architecture. Again, this will sound familiar to many of you. But mm, this move is a slow process, during which the monolith needed to stay reliable and performant so we could serve the business. So we employed a few solutions to successfully achieve this goal of reliability and performance. And in the next few slides, I have simplified the solutions as recipes to follow for particular generalized scenarios. So let's get started. Let's look at simplified scenario one. We have a single web service that serves all kinds of web requests, front-end requests, API requests, public-private internet requests, all of them. The machine needs to have a constant size because it's serving all requests. For example, if this is on Heroku, then it's a single application with multiple 2x dynos, or if it's on Kubernetes or ECS, then all the containers have the same CPU and memory requirements. Note that I haven't included a block for load balancers. Let's assume that we have load balancers in place, and uh, let's assume the same in subsequent diagrams. So with this simple scenario, who wants to shout out one of the problems with this setup? Anybody? Maybe one of the room captains. <laughs> Okay, I feel like I'm putting you on the spot. <laughs> um, let's talk about the problems. All our containers need to have the largest resource reservation because any container can get the most resource-consuming request. This means we don't get to intelligently balance our resources. Secondly, many of us use a front-facing layer to guard the app against DDoS attacks from the public internet. The problem is that even our internal applications have to suffer the resulting latency of this extra front-facing layer. And if there's a problem with the CDN, then our internal HTTP communication is affected just as badly as our customers. Furthermore, because it's all the same kind of web service, reports of errors do not clearly show what kind of requests are failing. Finally, a faulty deployment of one kind of workload can adversely affect all services. If you released something that started crashing your containers as a result of an API request, then all of your web requests are going to be affected because any request can land on any container. To solve these problems, our first recipe calls for having a separate web service for each kind of web request. Note that this is the same code and perhaps even the same command to run the server. They'll just be separate DNS entries that point to different um, processes. Secondly, we place a reverse proxy or router in front of our service. This router is where all requests land first. Our router can be split into separate services, one reachable by the public internet and one with, from within our private network, where all our applications are. So how does this recipe, how does this setup help us? Firstly, 
it means that we can make use of our resources more intelligently because our web services no longer need to be given the resources to serve the most resource-heavy request. If API requests require less resources, we, allot, we allocate fewer resources to that service, and so on. Secondly, we separate public and private traffic, web traffic. Sending traffic, traffic over the public internet costs more. So this action results in savings because our private internal traffic will no longer have to go over the public internet. It also means that our internal applications are served faster because we no longer have that CDN layer in between. And it also means that when our CDN layer faces an outage, our internal HTTP communication is not affected. Moreover, faulty workloads are now scoped to the kind of server. If you have a deployment that affects API requests, the other kind of requests are no longer affected because they're not landing on the same containers. <coughs> Finally, the proxy layer, the router, the reverse proxy, gives us the flexibility to have a faster switch that we can use to route traffic. This is very useful when running A-B tests to separate uh, A-B tests to a separate new service if we want to extract functionality. Super useful when you're making the move from monolithic service to service-oriented architecture. Let's move on to simplified scenario two. Similar to our web request setup, we have set up a job processor that processes all kinds of jobs. This can mean that all of our jobs are on the same kind of queue or that our processor is periodically polling different queues, but it's still one process. Who wants to shout out one of the problems with this setup? Anybody? Room captains, go ahead, shout it out. Yeah. But it's a low power job. You have a high power job that's having a problem because parts are going to run delayed uh, when they shouldn't be. Absolutely. Two, two separate problems uh, and uh, very good points. So, first, we have the same resource allocation problem because each job process can get the heaviest job, they all need to be of the same size. So if you have different containers of this process, they all need to, have, they all need to be able to process the most resource consuming job. Second, because we have only one process, it's going to have only one polling frequency. This makes it really problematic to process urgent jobs before the low priority ones. Third, when there is a failure, our error report won't immediately point us to the problematic workload we would have to dig in to find out which queue and which job was the culprit. So, okay, how do we solve this? In recipe two, we try to separate the jobs as much as possible. Ideally, we have one queue per job, but realistically, we'll have bundled jobs in a queue according to their urgency. And we'll have a job processor per queue. Note that, like in recipe one, these are changes that happen on the outskirts of our monolith very few, if any, application code changes will be required. So how does recipe two benefit us? First, the same point as recipe one, we no longer need to over-provision each job processing container. Second, we ensure that each job processor pulls its respective queue at the most suitable rate. Then a failure report will immediately identify which kind of jobs were failing. So if you have Q1, that's urgent. And if you have Q2, that's less urgent. Maybe you can ignore errors on the second queue and action the first ones faster. Finally, this kind of setup helps us offload our queues to separate data stores. This means that one data store is affected for whatever reason, jobs on the other queues keep on processing normally. And speaking of data stores, our simplified scenario three. In this scenario, we have all kinds of database interactions reaching the same database with the same credential set. And this is more common than you think. Web requests, background jobs, data extraction, all reaching the same database. This means that our spikes in read operations can affect our write operations by throttling our queries. It also means that unless we shard our data, we can only upgrade vertically to a limit because all vendors have a limit, even if 90% of our operation are reads. 
one more point, database logs usually have information on which database user executed a query. Having one credential set means that in addition to requests having more access than they need, our database logs are not going to help us in easily tracing a query back to the workload source because all queries will be appearing against the same user. Finally, a faulty deployment can take up all the database connections and keep valid requests from being completed because they won't be able to reach the database. So what do we do? We employ a combination of connection poolers, read replicas, and separate credential set per use case. You can see that our one set of read write requests is going, to, is going through the first connection pooler that connects to the leader database, whereas use cases that are purely read operations and ones that can accept a certain level of latency go through another connection pooler that reaches our database replicas after some load balancing step. How does this help us? This helps us by keeping each database within its read write operations limit. Uh, separate connection poolers means that connection exhaustion is less likely to occur across workloads. And because we have a separate username per workload, database logs can now help us directly tie queries to workloads. Tracing back becomes a lot easier. Finally, we ensure that a workload does not have more access than it needs. So you don't want somebody in BI to accidentally write data to your production database. So these three simple recipes were some operational recipes that will help your monolith. But let's talk about some meta recipes. Let's talk about recipe four, improving development workflows. A big part of reliability is perceived reliability. If your engineers are perceiving that the monolith is difficult to work with, they're going to label it unreliable and they're going to find ways to not work on the monolith. They, therefore, improving development workflows is essential if you want to continue people to work on the reliability of the monolith. A small example can be making CI runs faster, which will reduce the time that engineers have to wait for their builds to complete. It's likely that as your application grew, the structure of your test suite remained the same if you are facing pains in this area, look into how you can separate your test suite in chunks and execute those chunks in parallel. Speeding up the monolith's CI will benefit everybody and all of your team members will volunteer to buy you drinks. Uh, similarly, if in your development workflow, uh, engineers have to push a lot of levers or press a lot of buttons or go through a number of steps before their code reaches production, Revisit the process and find out if any of those levers can be removed or reduced or the steps can be made easier. Recipe five, improve mean time to detect. Outages happen with every application. Usually what sets a monolith's incidents apart is that it can take some time to find out what actually is going wrong. In your post-mortem meetings, remember to have a section that focuses on improving how you could have found out the problem faster. If you can detect the problem faster through better metrics or better alerting, you can action it sooner and have your monolith be more reliable and make the on-call engineer's life easier. Recipe six, actively know your vendor's limits. This is very important. Uh, many of us use external vendors for databases, compute, etc. But very few of us will have dashboards or alerts set up that trigger warnings for when we are reaching our vendor's limits. We might have some basic metrics in place, such as containers reaching 100% CPU, well, not 100%, 90%, something like that, or a database reaching close to its storage capacity. But limits here refers to things that are only exposed at scale. For example, the read-write operations threshold for a database, a metric that's very vendor-specific and specific to the tier of database you're using, or the bytes per second or packets per second limit of your private network, again, a vendor-specific limit. These are very real limits that you should actively be aware of, and usually they're only exposed at scale. Engage your vendor and find out everything that can affect the reliability of your monolith. Then plan against it. Having shared these six recipes, I'd like to share that you can tame the beast. All you need is a mindset where you can openly collaborate with application engineers 
to really look into how the monolith's workloads are set up. I know many people here, well, SREs generally belong to platform groups, and we don't work closely with the application engineers, but you, when you have one monolith that affects the reliability of all teams, it's time for everybody to work together to start looking for solutions. And when you are in that collaboration phase, find ways to separate workloads by concerns and resources, find ways to improve the monolith's observability, and find ways to make working on the monolith easier. The easier you make working on it, the easier you make it to implement solutions. Note that even if you plan on leaving the monolith behind as legacy technology, there will be a period of time that you will need to keep the monolith afloat. I hope that the recipes I've shared will help you in accomplishing that goal. And having said that, I open the floor to any questions you have. Thanks.